Let's turn to Luke chapter 4. We're going to try to wrap up our series tonight. I don't know how successful we'll be at it because I added one more. So we went from 13 to 14. So we'll see if we can hit the last three tonight. But I'm not so much worried about time or if we have to continue on next week. I've learned one thing about the things of God. Don't get in a hurry. Don't get in a hurry with the things of God. Because either you're going to rush through and somebody's going to miss something that they have need of that will benefit their life. Or if it's on the maybe other things in the, th- in the kingdom of God, you brush through, you try to rush to get to something that maybe God's told you to get to. And then you bypass so many other things or you miss the timing of God in it. You know, that's one of the things I've learned from Dr. Barclay and my pastor, Pastor Chris, is the right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing. <laughs> So, or the, the wrong thing at the right time is still the wrong thing. So it's how, no matter how you take it, shake it, if you take one of the rights out, then it's still going to be wrong. So we've got to make sure that we have the right timing, the right thing, and you know, all of those things are, are lined out just the way that they should be, and everything will fall into place, and God will receive the glory and the honor for it. Amen. So real quick, just to review uh, very quickly, I uh, want to go over some of these. We are on number 12, but number one is confess Jesus before men. Now, again, these are our Christian basic training uh, principles, we could say. These are things Christians must do, and we'll notice that every one of these have had Jesus speaking on them. So number one is confess Jesus before men. Number two is deny themselves. Number three, carry their cross. And I'm kind of rushing through these because these are review. Number four is follow Jesus. Number five is endure to the end. Number six is have self-discipline. Number seven is know who Jesus is. Number eight, sacrifice the desires of the heart to obey God and his word. Number nine, not be offended. Number 10, love God with everything they have. Number 11, go to church in person. And I will say I just wrote an article on that because I've been... I'm not one to just take what I preach and write it into an article, but these I thought, that's pretty important that I think our region needs to hear. If they're not hearing us through visual or through audio, they can at least read it in the paper. That one was hard for me to write. Go to church in person. Because you only get 600 words when it comes to an article in the paper. So it was hard for me to keep it under 600 words. (laughs) You say, well, how is that, Pastor? Well, because of technology and because of everything and nowadays and and the way that society works, many people don't like to do things in person. They like to stream. So, in other words, they don't go to the theaters much. They like to stream at home. So, if you have that mentality with your social, or your, we would say your entertainment, that bleeds over into how you treat God. So, many people quit going to church and just watching it. Just watching it on TV, or watching it on YouTube, or watching it on whatever. Well, that, I mean, that's fine and good if you're sick, or if you need to stay home, but you need to be in the house of God, because that's where the anointing is. Amen. I'm not going to preach it. We've already taught it, so I'm going to keep moving on. Number 12, that leads us to number 12. Read the Word of God. Read the Word of God. So number 12 is read the Word of God. So Luke chapter 4, verse 17. We'll back up to verse 16. We spoke about this one and going to church in person. It says, and when he, speaking of Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, And as his custom was, so we understand his custom was to go to the house of God. That should be our custom. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. What's he reading? The word of God. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or we would say Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Notice not only is Jesus has, has a custom to go to the house of God, but when he goes, he reads the word. Now, I have a lot of pastoral friends, not only in this region, but now across the world and all across the United States. And we all differ. We, we're all going to have different ways. There's no such thing as a perfect church. No such thing as a perfect pastor. We get that. Everybody's going to do things a little bit differently. 
But I like to follow the example of Jesus here. One, he goes to, to the house of God in person, but then when he goes to the house of God, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophets. So in other words, he gets his hands on the Holy Scripture. He gets his hands on the Word of God. Now we know at this time, they keep it in scrolls. They keep it put up to where not everybody can just go in there and grab a hold of it. There's not Bibles printed like we have today. But still, for the Son of God, our example, Jesus Christ, to go into the house of God and to have His hands upon the Holy Word and to open it up and to read it, that should be an example for each and every one of us. <laughs> because... Especially as many churches as, as Miss Tiffany and I visited when we were in the military, trying to find where we were to land while we were at, you know stationed at different places, you would go into many churches and we would be carrying our Bibles and things. And you'd go in and not hardly anybody carried a Bible. Why? Because it was going to be thrown up on the jumbotron. So I'm thinking, okay, if you're not carrying the Word of God on the Sabbath day, how much are you really reading it at home? <laughs> Because truth be told, you could, you could get to talking to some of them very quickly and find out they don't read the Word of God at home. And that's, I'm not making fun of them. I'm saying you could talk very quickly, just in a, a conversation of four or five minutes, you could find out real quick how much they know the Word of God. And again, that's not a put down. That's just a judging where are they at spiritually? Where are they at? What's the fruit of this person? What's the fruit of this church? How, how strong are the disciples made at this church? How strong is the core believers of this church? And so that should let you know how much you can be discipled at a local church based on the average sheep. Now, you know, there's going to be some that they don't do anything. They, they're just barely getting by in life, just trying to make it to church, read the word ever so often and just barely scraping by. They're just barely getting in there. Then you got the people who have all the time in the world. They can devote their whole entire life to the things of God, which is awesome. So you can't judge it by either one of those. You got to find the average, the average strength of the sheep to say, all right, this is where everything meets in the middle. This is the average strength or the average characteristics of the sheep when averaged together. Now, again, that sounds judgy, but you've got to say, if I'm wanting to be discipled in the things of God, how much is the Word taught? How much is it emphasized to read the Word of God? Because a church, and a, especially a pastor, can only disciple you as far as they've gone. They can only disciple you, because you can't push somebody up higher than what you are. So you can only bring them up to your level, and for the pastor, he should always be at least one step ahead, not out of arrogance and pride and saying, oh, I'm beating you, oh, I'm beating you, because how can he lead if you're on the same level with him? Now, I will say there was a church that we attended for a little while in, in Fort Polk, and the people, they were, they were sweet for a season, but it would come to a point to where the, the pastor asked me to minister for him, and when I did, it was almost like from that point forward, he, he did not like me. And he'd done everything he, everything he could to run me out until we finally left the military. We left there and came back here to serve under Pastor Chris. But it was almost like once I opened my mouth and began to preach, I, something flipped in that pastor. Something flipped in him. I never bragged about what I had come from, how many years I'd been preaching, what all I'd done for the kingdom of God. Never bragged about that. So when I get up to preach, I just do what the Lord has called me to do for all of those years. I knew we were there to help be a blessing unto him, to help him, because it was a smaller church. They had just gotten into a little storefront thing, and so we were wanting to be a blessing unto them just to help serve while we were there because we knew we wouldn't be there forever. But when he asked me to preach, something flipped in him. And I was like, all right, I guess this, this is where we're going to be until we leave. As far as like this, this relationship, because I would try to talk to him, and he didn't like it. So I knew then, okay, something is insecure in this man, and really, he can't lead me any further than where he's at right now. And so that, I don't like, I don't like the expression, but we can understand it. That kind of broke my heart of... Something so simple, instead of allowing me to help serve and, and be in the house of God and not have that insecurity run him, 
He allowed it to overtake him and then turn on somebody that's there to help him. So I say that to say, if we're looking for that discipleship, if we're looking for the place of God where we're supposed to be, one of the emphasis we are, are all as Christians is to read the word of God. We're all to read the word, just as Jesus said here. So he gives this example, not just because he's the son of God, not just because he's the rabbi. He gives this for us to look at and say, okay, I'm to go to the house of God in person and I'm to read the word of God. So again, that's the reason I like, I mean, I I also take after my pastor and my spiritual father. I like to have this in my hand to be able to read from it because I can bank on these words are not going to change while I'm reading it. I can flip the page and I can flip back and they're not going to change. <laughs> there's, been, there's been times I have gotten into my app on my phone because I have Bible apps on my phone, so I'm not like all super holy and don't, you know, oh, I don't believe in that, only word only. No, no, we have, I have Bible apps, we get that. So I pull it up on there and I noticed one day that in one of the translations I have, I was like, wait a minute. That's something's missing from this. And so I look at it. And so I, I go and on my shelves, I have different translations as well. So I pull one out and I lay it down and I'm comparing the one that's on my app to the one that's printed. Now, granted, the one that's printed is a few years old, but the one that's on the app is brand new. It fre- refreshes all the time. I go and I find this verse and I say, wait a minute. And I start reading it and I'm like, that goes from there. And then it says this and it says this. Now, this is the same translation. Goes from here to here, then it skips to here. Wait a minute, what's wrong with this? Come to find out, it skips one of the verses that's printed, but it's on the app. It's not on the app. That confirmed what I'd been saying for a couple of years, even as a pastor. And that was just a couple of weeks ago. When you go by just electronics, which electronics is good, but when that's all you got to go by, you don't know how much of your Christianity is changing because you're watching it and you're trusting whoever has built that app to keep you in tune with God. Whereas when you have this, that's not going to change. Somebody can't go in there and wipe something out on you unless they are really of the devil and going to your house and, and almost trying to rob you and sneak into your word. I would think they'd have better things to do than to go and wipe out your Bible. Anyway, we get the point though. So coming back to this, verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So it's going to take him a minute to find it because these are scrolls. So he's got to scroll through. We don't, he, we don't, he didn't have the verse 6, verse 7, verse 8 like we do. He has to find it and know where it's at. Know what's coming up. Know, oh, oh, that's too far. Let me go back. Oh, there it is. Or, or I know I haven't gone far enough yet. Yep. Yep, I remember when Isaiah said that. I remember when Isaiah said that because it's Jesus. Because he was there when all of it was written. Remember that. So he's like, yep, 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 there it is. And so he goes to it and then he reads aloud. Reads aloud. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. (laughs) Uh, All right, Lord. Sometimes I think that's the only time that the people of God had the Spirit upon them was when they read it out loud. Feel a little punchy now. I don't know why. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because sometimes the Spirit of the Lord is not upon somebody unless they're reading it. Why? Because they've lived too much like a hellion and then all of a sudden say, oh, I've got to shake it off. I've got to put my religious suit on so I can go in the house of God. And then they put on the religious front and then as soon as they get done with that, they go right back out to the world. So we've got to be careful that we're reading the word of God each and every day as much as we can. I know we can't do two hours of study every day. That's unrealistic. I'm a pastor. I can't study two hours of solid time in one day for that. Now, I like to get up early, study as much as I can. Generally, it's, it's just under two hours. I try to get in more than that. But throughout the day, I try to fit in what I can as well. So that's me being a pastor. That's me studying for myself and studying to help get a sermon together to preach. I also work a full-time job. I'm also a husband. I'm also a father. I'm also you know, a pastor, not just preparing sermons, but pastor checking on sheep, pastor going to the hospital and visiting people, other things I've got going on. So if, 
if I can try to squeeze out as much time as I can, what's the average, average Christian's excuse? Well, I just ain't got no time. I just ain't got no time. Now, you, you'll have time what you make for. Whatever is, whatever is in your heart, whatever your heart's desire is, that's what you'll make time for. <laughs> My uncle had a 65, 66 Mustang, if I remember right. Might have been a 67. Anyway, that's, that's beside the point. It took him years of working on this Mustang to rebuild it and make it just pristine condition. Beautiful. He worked on it from when I was, I was young. I mean, I was, I was still maybe eight or nine years old up until I was in high school, something of that nature. Why? Because he worked. He was still a father. He was still a husband. But he took his time do, building that car right, and he still has it. That car is immaculate. I mean, it is beautiful. It is a beautiful piece of machinery, especially to be a Ford. It's beautiful. <laughs> Anyway, that's, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Don't be offended. Remember, we talked about that. That's number nine. Don't be offended. Anyway, but with that, he took his time and he did it right. Why? Because he devoted time each and every day. Every chance he got, he devoted time to it. He didn't neglect the other things in his life, but he still devoted specific time to that to see it come along. And over the years, you could see the progression. Each day may have not seemed like a major progression, but over time you began to see the effects of that little bit at a time, little bit at a time. That's what our Christian life should be. We may not see ma massive jumps and leaps and bounds overnight, but our progression of our life, because we stay faithful, because we stay consistent to the things of God, we'll begin to see that over time, yes, how much, how far we've come in the things of God, because we didn't quit, because we kept doing it, we kept giving in, we kept giving in to the things of God, giving that time, giving that time, giving that time, giving that energy, giving whatever else it is that we need to the kingdom of God, and see that progression, and we can turn back and look and say, that's how far God has brought me, because I didn't quit, and because I stayed faithful to to what he told me to do. But if we quit reading the word, our progression will stop right where we, we quit reading. Because, I mean, even the New, New Testament talks about Janice and John, as they came no further. I may be mixing a couple of them together. But it says that they come no further. It's a Pauline epistle. It says they come no further. Why? Because that's where they stopped growing in the things of God. And they can't progress until they fix that. And when they fix their life, when they fix their doctrine, when they fix what's out of joint with the things of God, then they can progress. Well, if we can see that reading from the Word of God, and we've only hit one verse so far, we've got a couple more to read, but if we can understand we have sound doctrine of we're supposed to be reading the Word of God, then that should be something in us to say, this is a basic training principle that I need to apply to my life. Just in basic Christianity, I need to be reading the Word of God regularly to keep myself fed the Word of God. Now, you don't, we don't just eat one meal a day. Now, if you're trying to lose weight, you might. But if you do that, what usually happens is your body stores it as fat because it says, I don't know when we're going to eat again, so let's just store it all up as best we can. So even that's not good. You're supposed to have small meals throughout the day. Well, that makes sense, Pastor. Well, you're supposed to have small biblical meals all throughout the day. Because let's face it, you do a study in the morning. By noon, the devil's already thrown a few things at you. Somebody's rare their ugly head up in their flesh, trying to get you all upset in your flesh. So what do you need? You need a, you need a Bible break. Wash that junk off of you. I have the water of the washing, the washing of the water of the word. Just wash that up. Lord, wash me. Lord, wash me. Help me. Just let, me let, let me have the peace of the word of God wash over me just to wash, flush all this stuff off of me right now. And then that helps you get through the rest of your day. That's why we have midweek service is to help wash the stuff off of us so that we can progress through the rest of the week. <laughs> so we, we, can, I mean, we can see this as we, as we read this as well. But at verse 18 again, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Notice Jesus is quoting this. We know that this is a prophecy of him, but yet he's still reading the word of God aloud. That's the reason as many times as I may say, 
Write this down if you'd like to. It may be an additional scripture, but we're going to read as many as we can fit in for time's sake. <laughs> Sometimes it's like people will say, well, I don't have 30 verses to read. I like having 30 verses to read. I don't know why you wouldn't. I mean, it's the Word of God. I mean, this is going to preach a lot better than I can. Just reading the Word of God is going to do a lot better than what anything I could drum up and have an example of. But anyway, but Jesus reads the Word of God. He reads it out. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach and deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, or we would say them that are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Praise God. So let's go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. I'm going to start at verse 16. John 7, 16. And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. So Jesus says, This is not my doctrine, this is God's doctrine. Wait a minute. You mean that Jesus says it's not about what he believes, it's not about what he establishes? No, it's all about the Father. Now, for some people, that might cause a head tilt. What do you mean? Well, we know that Jesus is the Word made flesh. We get that. But everything Jesus does points to the Father. Everything He does gives glory and honor to the Father. Now, I'm going to be honest. There, there are times, you know, we'll say, Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to critique that. We're worshiping God. I, will, I never will forget, though, when I was working on one of my degrees through Liberty University, which is a, I, I really appreciate that college, but one of my professors told me, it never tells you in the Bible to worship Jesus. Because everything Jesus did was worship the Father. So that... Being rebuked at one time, and it wasn't even really a rebuke, it was a correction from one of my papers, and I was like, oh, it caused me to tighten up and say, oh, yeah, that's right. Because he says, Jesus says that God seeks those to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so from there, from there on, now again, every once in a while I'll say, Lord, we worship you, Jesus, we thank you, we worship you, Jesus. We'll say that, but really our heart, and maybe we can line our mouths up with it as well if you want to be that picky about it, but I don't think God's going to split hairs with you. But really everything that we do is to glorify God the Father. Jesus is the bridge maker for us in our sinful nature to be forgiven of our sins to make our way to the Father. Because remember, Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. The Still the object and the point of Christianity is to get to the Father. But it's through Christ that we're able to make that bridge. We're able to make our way to the Father through Jesus Christ. Well, how can we make it? Through the Word. Well, Jesus is the Word made flesh. So we still need the Word to get to the Father. Well, you don't need to read that Old Testament. You don't need to read this. You don't need to read that. Well, Jesus said, those that do the will of my Father, well, how do you know what the will of the Father is unless you know what his doctrine is? Jesus says right here, my doctrine is not mine. How did Jesus know what to do? Because he knew the Father and he knew the doctrine of God. He knew God's written word, just as he just read Isaiah. He goes and, and reads it out. There's Isaiah. He says, this is what I've come to do. I'm going to let everybody know this is what God has sent me, the Messiah, to do this. He said this, it's written down, this is what I'm refreshing your memory on, and this is what I've, call, I've come to do. And then he puts it up. So Jesus here, that, that was what we read in Luke, what Jesus says here, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Our doctrine is not ours. We can't make up our own doctrine. We cannot make up our own doctrine. We've got to go by the word. Well, if you, if you go to a church and they're making up their own doctrine, how do you know if they're making it up or not unless you know the Word? That's, that's where many people get in trouble is they, well, the preacher said, well, the preacher said, well, the preacher said. You sound like Rain Man. The preacher said, the preacher said. Well, that's awesome. If you have a good preacher and you trust him, that's awesome. I'll tell you right now, don't take my word for it. Take the, God's word for it. <laughs> I've often said, I've said it a few times, using an example. One lady, when I first became pastor, said, 
I'm judging you. I'm judging everything you say. I said, well, go right ahead. Judge it by the word. If I'm, not, if I'm out of the word, if I'm not in the word and I'm out of line with the word, let me know. I mean, she meant it as a backhanded compliment. I took it as a true compliment. Yeah, judge me. I encouraged her. Judge me. Judge me by the word. If I'm out of line, find somewhere else to go or call me out on it. Because I don't want to be out of line. I don't want to be out of the word of God. I want to be in the word of God. That's what I want to preach from. I'm a word guy. I like to know what the word says. I like to know what words mean. But I like to know what the word says. Amen. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If, verse 17, any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Mm. You mean you won't know Jesus Christ unless you know the doctrine of God? You don't know who Jesus is unless you know the doctrine of God. Let's read it again. Not my words, what Jesus said. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. He shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He's saying, the only way you're going to really know me is if you know the doctrine of God. He said, because if I speak of my own, you'll know it's not God, it's me. That's what he's getting at. So, this is the reason I'm also baffled at times of when people start to talk about, well, Jesus this and Jesus that. And I'm like, what Jesus are you talking about? Because that doesn't line up with the word of God. That's not the same Jesus I read after. Well, Jesus, Jesus wants everybody just to live in sin and be okay. And he'll just welcome them in, into his utopia of sin and just hippy-dippy love and grace. Well, that's not what God says. That's not what the word of God says. Jesus says, you've got to be born again. Go and sin no more. I mean, he lays it out. You've got to deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow him, be able to confess him before men. I mean, we've already covered quite a few things that Jesus has said to make it to heaven. But already here he says, if you don't know the doctrine of God, then you're not going to know if I'm speaking of myself or not. He says, if you do know the doctrine of God, then you know that I'll be speaking of myself if I'm speaking anything contrary. So it would do good for all of us as Christians to read the word of God. And then when we see this false Jesus, we can say, that's not really the anointed one. That's not really Jesus Christ. That's a made up Jesus. That's somebody who's trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus. And then when we hear the truth, we can say, that bears witness. There's a lot of verses that back that up. <laughs> I would rather back up everything I say with the word of God than any opinion. Because opinion are like feet. Everybody has them and they all stink. <laughs> Amen. Verse, let's see, that's verse 19. Well, verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. Uh-oh. So if somebody starts preaching a different Jesus, they're not after the glory of Jesus. Whose glory are they after? Their own. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. No unrighteousness. That means there's no... When we're right with God, when we're in right standing with God, it will be evident. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean we got it all figured out. It just means you can tell real quick who, who tries to live clean and holy and who doesn't care. Sadly, there are, there are Christians that will use that label... They really don't care if they live right or not. And it gets more evident as each year passes, and any more as each day passes. People really don't care. Well, that's just who I am. That's just who I am. You're just going to have to deal with it. Here you tell me, preacher. Well, the preacher's supposed to be preaching the word of God, and you're supposed to line up with it. <laughs> We're in, we don't line up to a preacher. We line up to the word. Even the preacher has to line up to the word. Amen. But verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? <laughs> Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews, the keepers of the law, the people that thrive on keeping the law. And what's he say? Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Mm, that's like, that's like I hitting Tina right there. That's some, that's some hard slapping right in the face. Like, you ain't paying attention. He says, none of you keep the law. He just indicted everybody under the sound of his voice. 
He said, none of you keep the law. Then he goes on to say, why go ye about to kill me? He says, none of y'all keep the law, so why are you coming after me? What's he getting at? Well, they are, they are saying that he's blasphemous, that he's degrading the law, so yet they're wanting to kill him because of it. But yet none of them keep the law, and they don't seek to kill themselves. They don't seek to be punished under the law. So, unless they... But see, they know the Word of God to some effect, but they don't allow it to take effect in their life. That's the difference. A religious person will know the Word only to have the appearance or to argue a true person that knows Jesus and knows God applies the Word to their heart and their life. They read the Word to know God, not read the Word to have a facade. Made that rhyme for you. Amen. Mm -hmm. So let's skip down to verse 37. Verse 37 says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Shall flow rivers of living water. Now, see, so we can see here that when Jesus stands up in this feast, he's not telling them, Hey, go and be, go and do this, go and do that. He says, if any man really hungers, if you'll come to me, you're hungry and thirsty. He says, if you'll come to me and drink, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Why is that important? Because Jesus is the word made flesh. He says, if you'll come and partake of me, out of, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. So, not only are we to know Jesus, but we're to know the Word, because really you can't separate the two. Jesus is the Word made flesh. We've said that quite a few times tonight, but that should, under, that should help us understand how much we need to know the Word. We need to know the Word just as much as we know Jesus, because He is the Word. Know Jesus, know the Word. Know the Word, you'll know Jesus. But yet people want to separate the two. They want to keep Jesus, but not keep the Word. So you tell me how that works doctrinally. That's the reason people have this facade of Jesus or have this new Jesus is because they want to get rid of the word so that way they can make this Jesus appear who they want him to be. And you can't do that. You can't separate him and the word. So if you want to write this down, John 17, 17. John 17, 17. That will finish out our number 12. Number 13. Number 13. Have a shepherd. Or we would say have a pastor. Let's go to John chapter 10, verse 7. John chapter 10, verse 7. So number 13, have a shepherd. Or have a pastor. John 10, verse 7 says, Then said Jesus unto them again. So notice he's, say, he's speaking again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief... Cometh not but, to, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. The wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so, I, even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life, that I, might, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, 
but I laid it down myself, of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. Or we would say, take it, take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So that's a lot of reading, Pastor. Yes. But we can see how much Jesus focuses on having a shepherd, having a shepherd, having a shepherd. Well, we know that Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd. He's the chief shepherd of this church. He's the ultimate pastor of this church. And if we align ourselves biblically, that's what he should be for every church, even though sometimes he's not. He should be the chief shepherd of every church. But under him, you're going to have maybe the under shepherd, which is going to be the person that is, we'll say, physical or natural that you can touch. That's going to be the under shepherd to each church. So having natural sheep, you've got to have a physical shepherd to be there. Because if you just had sheep in a pasture and there was really no shepherd, even though there may be one in theory or there may be one in, by name, if you don't have one physically there, you really don't have anybody taking care of the sheep. Now, I paint that for a couple of reasons. One reason, Jesus is the chief shepherd. We know he's not a theory. He is alive and well, sitting at the right hand of the Father. We get that. But he's not physically here on earth. So what does he do? He has an under-shepherd that we'll get to in a moment. He has an under-shepherd that he puts in charge of the local flocks to make sure the sheep are taken care of. And they have somebody they can look at. They have somebody to speak to them and to call out the commands or the orders that they are to follow to be fed, to be well taken care of, to drive the wolves away, to have all these other things, protections and things that shepherds bring to their sheep. But I also say, if you have the chief shepherd, but yet you have no one in person, then there's nobody to look at. There's nobody to follow. There's chaos. Wolves can come in, do whatever they want to. This is double fold. If you don't have a person there that's leading the, the way, chaos ensues. So this is one of my biggest reasons why we don't pipe in church. We don't just watch it on TV, even in a local gathering, is because if you have nobody there to physically watch to God, to guide you, to help you, then all you're doing is you're just having this theory of a pasture of, a, of sheep Pasture, not pastor. Pasture of sheep with nobody to really lead them. Because if you pipe in somebody through, then they're watching somebody on TV, and, but that pastor does not know them. So let's look at this from Scripture, because don't just take my word for it. Let's look at it from the Scripture. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good, the good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. Then we can see, verse 13, the hireling fleeth. Because he's a hireling, careth not for the sheep. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. This is where I firmly agree with my pastor. If your pastor does not know your name, you do not have a pastor. What's this say? I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. The shepherd should know his sheep. But then it goes on to say, and am known of mine. That means the sheep know him. He knows the sheep, and the sheep know him. Now, <laughs> for, for me being under Pastor Chris for quite a few years now, it's one of those things to where I could be around certain people, and they may know Pastor Chris's name, but we may be in a conversation of just talking about something you know, has to do with Pastor Chris, and, and they may say, well, yeah, Pastor Chris... Man, if he, if he was to this and he was to that, boy, he would be this and he'd be that. Just like if something was to happen and they would give their opinion of what, how he would react. And then I, I would, <laughs> this has happened a couple of times, so I'm, I'm trying not to give the exact example away. But this has happened a couple of times where they would say, yeah, if Pastor Chris knew about this or Pastor Chris was around when this happened, this is what he would do. And I'm like, uh, mm, I no, I don't really think so. I, I don't really think that's the way he would react or what he would say. Oh, but yeah, he would. Yeah, he, no, I don't think so. 
And I've been in those situations to where I've seen Pastor Chris react to certain things. And it always makes my heart rejoice when he reacts the way that I think he's going to react. Why? Because not to say, oh, I told you so. No, no, no. Because hopefully I've caught my pastor's heart enough to say, this is how he's going to react. This is how he views this. This is what he sees from the word. This is how he's going to judge this by the word. And hopefully I'm in tune with that or there's a disconnect between my pastor and I. So even for that, we can say the good shepherd knows his sheep, <laughs> which is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Because I know sometimes when something happens in the church, this is how this person is going to react. This is how this person is going to react. And this person is just not going to care because it's just not in their nature. So that's more than just knowing the name. That's knowing their character, knowing more about them. But also, the sheep should know how the shepherd's going to react. Why? Because they spend time with him. <laughs> if, if people are so far off scale of that, you may want to judge how much you know your pastor. Amen. And we know that pastors don't, they can't spend all day with you, every day with you. But if God has put you under them and around them for a reason, you should catch their heart. And what they have in them and what they are able to put in you, you should be able to catch because it will help you go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. That's like being under around Pastor Chris. I knew there was things in him and still are that I need in my life to help me, prepare me for the things in my life. Anyway. Verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So we can see it's important to have a shepherd. It's important to have a pastor in your life to help that relationship to be taken care of, to have all the provision that a shepherd would give his sheep. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, very familiar scripture regarding shepherds or pastors. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start at verse 8. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. This is Paul writing about Jesus. He's actually quoting uh, some of the Psalms. So he's quoting other scripture. But he says, when he ascended up on high, led captivity, captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Side note, some people believe that Jesus did not go to hell. This verse says he, do, he did. So, yeah, people, some people try to overlook that or, no, oh, Jesus, Jesus can't go to hell. Well, he did for you and I that we could be born again and, to, and to, to preach captive, to preach freedom and liberty to the captives so they may have the choice to go to heaven. So verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So we can see that in my King James that verses 9 and 10 are in parentheses, so we can see that that's helping understand what Paul is writing. So if we go from verse 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, that should lead us right into verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. New Living Translation of the beginning of verse 11 says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. So I'm going to read that again. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. So if Jesus says these gifts, we would know as the fivefold ministry, fivefold ministers, if they're important enough for Jesus to say these are gifts I'm giving to the church, then why do some Christians believe they don't need a pastor? Why do some Christians believe, well, that's just a gift, that's just a gift of Jesus Christ. I really don't need anything that he has to offer me. That's what you say when you say, I don't need a pastor. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't, I don't need you know, any of the fivefold ministers. I don't really need that. I don't really need the church. That's 
Antichrist. That's the spirit of Antichrist is where what that is. Because <laughs> that would be like for somebody to give you a birthday gift and say, eh, you know what, I really don't want it. But, but this is you know, keys to a brand new car that you need. Your other one's worn out. And it's, I mean, you keep riding in that thing, it's going to fall apart on you and you may die in a car accident. No, nah, I, don't, I, don't I don't need your gift. I'll just keep my old beat up jalopy. I'll just keep that. Even though I might die one day, I'll be all right. I don't need your gift. Now see, to us, that sounds silly. But that's what some people do spiritually. Jesus, I don't need your gift. I don't need your perfecting gifts of the fivefold ministers to help my life to mature in the things of God. I don't really need that. You keep that. I'm just going to stay on my path because me and Jesus got our own thing going and I'm on my way to hell and he's okay with it because I say he's okay with it. That's really what that means, by the way. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. In other words, you're not bending your knee to the King of kings and the Lord of lords and to the word of God. You're not bending to anything except for because you're too busy in pride. Anyway, so verse 11, and he gave some, he gave gifts to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, which by definition, get ready for this, means shepherd. No other definition, it just means shepherd. I looked, I looked in five or six different places trying to find, all right, just let's make sure there's no other word that kind of fits in there with this. Because you know I'm a word guy, I like to know what words mean. The only word it means, shepherd. That's it. So I think God put that in there for a reason to say, you need a shepherd. You can't weasel your way around this. You can't maneuver it to say, well, it means this. No, no, no. It just means shepherd. You need a shepherd. You need somebody to take care of you because you're a sheep. You're a sheep in the fold of God. You need a shepherd to help beat away the wolves, to provide you, show you where you need to be fed, show you what you have need of, provide all those things for you to lead you and guide you in paths of righteousness and of safety. <laughs> Verse 12, why did he give these fivefold ministries, or ministers? For the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing of the saints. That's the culprit. Many people don't want to grow up. Many people say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. Why? Because they're 45 stuck in an 18-year-old mindset. I can, do, I can still do donuts, I can still, watch this, I can bench press this, and I can still do this, and I can still do that. You start getting up in age, you got to watch your body. You go to lift certain weights, your back and your knees, you're going to say, nope, not anymore, big boy. <laughs> your body's going to say, no, we're not that young anymore. And some people have to come to a harsh realization. Amen. Praise God, I haven't, I haven't met that yet. Amen. <laughs> but now I will say, I, I realize I can't do the things I used to do, but I can still do things pretty well. Anyway, but for the fact of the saints, many people try to do things and be stuck in youthful lust, which the Bible tells us to flee from because they don't want to grow up. And so what do they do? They shy away from these fivefold ministers. They stay away from the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why? Because they don't want to grow up. They don't want to go from faith to faith and glory to glory. They are too busy being babes in Christ, still enjoying the milk, and refuse to grow up. Even though by now they should be young men, young women in Christ, or at least in young adulthood, they're still, they enjoy the milk too much. They enjoy having the carefree, living, how I want to Christianity because they refuse to grow up. Just because people refuse to grow up doesn't mean that God says, well, I guess you'll stay there. I guess I'll just have to let you stay there. No, because somewhere along the lines, you're disobeying God. Because God says to grow up. You need to, you need to mature in these things. You can't stay a babe all your life. I mean, all throughout the New Testament, especially the Apostle Paul, tells people, grow up, grow up. And if we believe that the Word of God is infallible, which it is, and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, which it is, then that means that we as Christians got to grow up. We can't stay babes. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto a complete man, 
unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. Uh-oh. Paul emphasized it twice already. Be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. This is why it's important to have fivefold ministers in your life, especially a pastor. The apostle, great, awesome, wonderful ministry to help you. But he's not married to the church. The prophets, wonderful, awesome, need them in the body of Christ. He's not married to the church. Evangelists, wonderful, awesome, seeing people born again, leading people to Christ, goes from town to town preaching the gospel, not married to the church. The pastor doesn't really go anywhere because he's stuck married to the church. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing because you need somebody that's faithful, that's consistent, that's there day in and day out, that's going to help lead because you, you wouldn't have a marriage if you were always gone. You're not going to have a marriage if you never communicate, if you're never around each other. When the, when the pastor is there, he's married to the church to help them understand a re- true relationship. Why do you think that throughout the Bible we see so many times God relates Jesus and the body of Christ or a relationship with God through a marriage? Because there's that union. There's that consistency. There's that togetherness. There's that unity or however you want to say it. There's that coming together in, in, in bonds and covenant that sh- shouldn't be broken very easily. Technically, it shouldn't be broken at all. We can understand with natural marriage, we understand that there are reasons for divorce. Anyway, we have no reason to divorce ourselves from God. No reason to divorce ourselves from Jesus Christ. Amen. But that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. How can you grow up and know what those things are unless you have a pastor to help you? The pastor is there to help you understand that's wicked. Stay away from that. Get away from this. That, watch that person. Watch that person. Because they, there's something shady about them. And that's not the pastor getting to say who's your friends and who's not. That's just, especially if he's a gift from Jesus Christ, you should use him to help you have that wisdom that maybe you can't see. Amen. But speaking the truth in love, that's one thing many people forget. Well, that pastor, he just wants my money. Well, that pastor, he just wants to tell me what to do. Well, if, if you remember that these are gifts given unto you by Jesus Christ, and when they speak, it's out of love, that will may help your attitude of gratitude towards those gifts. <laughs> That's like if my kids were to get me a gift, we'll say a birthday gift, and they were to get it for me, and I can tell in their face, and I can tell they don't want to give it to me, they could care less. That gift means nothing to me. But if they hand me a gift and I know that they've been working hard and they're so excited to give it to me, no matter what it is, it could be the smallest thing they handmade. That would mean more to me than something that mama went and picked out that they had no choice in or they didn't really care. Something they took the time and made out of love would mean so much more. So that lets us know how we perceive our pastor is how we perceive what they give us. Because if I were to say, you need to be in the Word, or you need to not be around these type of friends. Oh, what's he doing Tell me that? Why does he tell me I have to read the Word all the time? Why does he tell me I can't be around these people? Well, that means that you don't receive me as your gift. That, that means that you don't you don't, you don't think that I'm speaking out of love and protection for your soul. Because remember, a true shepherd has to give an account for his sheep. So I know we're in the middle of this, but if you want to write some of these verses down, I'm going to give you something that the Lord showed me because many people in this region, especially, and really it's, it's all over, but especially in this region, they see the pastor as just the guy that gets up, preaches, speaks, and he's the one that's kind of in charge of the church. And he just speaks. He puts together. He has nothing else to do. He has no life. He has no really family much. All, he, all he's to do is to write down a few notes, not take more than 30 minutes, get up, read a couple of scriptures, and then let everybody go in 30 minutes. That's the way many people see the pastor of a church. <laughs> Here's what biblically a pastor is. 
A pastor knows the condition of his flock. That's Proverbs 27, 23. That means he knows them, and we've already accounted that for other scripture where the, the shepherd, the pastor should know them, and they should know the pastor, the sheep should. The pastor must give an account for the souls of his sheep. That's Hebrews 13, 17. That means he's going to have to give an account before God, not just before man. He's got to give an account before God. God, this is how I shepherded your sheep. God, this is what I taught them. Now, whether they responded or not, that's on them, and you know that, Lord. But I, I gave the message you wanted me to give. Hmm. But on the flip side of that, as sheep, you, you're supposed to respond the way God wants you to respond to a message. Not just the way the, the, the pastor wants you to respond. Amen. Anyway, they must qualify by the word of God. The pastors must qualify by the word of God. Get ready. Titus 1, 5 through 9. Titus 1, 5 through 9. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. Again, that's 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5. And 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. That's the qualifications to be a pastor. That lets us know that not just anybody can qualify. Not just anybody can be a pastor. Now, so that is like a double-edged sword of reason I lay that out. One is for people to say, oh yeah, that just that preacher, they just put him in there. They just, just put him behind the pulpit. No, no, no. There's, if it's biblical, if it's biblical, you have to qualify. In some places we know that may be the case. That's just the warm body they put behind the pulpit. But biblically, you're supposed to qualify. On the flip side of that, if they qualify, that means they have done the work of the gospel to qualify for that position so there's honor and respect due that position, that office. Not just the person, the position, the office. That's like the President of the United States we may not like, you can pick whoever you want to. You may not like every president, but we're supposed to respect the office of the president. Anyway, and last note on this, and they are devoted to God and his word, Acts 6.4. They're devoted to God and his word, Acts 6.4. So hopefully that'll help maybe us and our region, maybe hopefully for us, a refresher maybe for our region, to understand that there's more to a pastor than just the preacher getting up and speaking for 30 minutes and he better hurry up, it's almost noon. <laughs> that's the reason I go to 12, 10, 12, 15. Amen. <laughs> anyway, that's a joke. We go however long the Lord wants us to go. Amen. So coming back to Ephesians here. Verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and, and the measure of every part, make an increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. I'm just going to, for time's sake, I'm going to tell you to write down that you can go through verse 24. Because I feel like we could hit this, we could go through it, and I think we would be justified in doing so but I think that we can move on to our next point but I want I wanted to read through verse 24 because there are so many points through there is the benefits of having the fivefold ministers in your life but especially the pastor if you read that you can see who being past feeling who's to help you not go past feeling the pastor he's to lay out the word before you to help you not cross that line of, being, of growing callous but you have not so learned of Christ well you can only say that if the pastor has been teaching you who Christ really is so we can see that there's many things verse 22 he put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust well, how, who's to help you understand what the old man is and what the new man's supposed to look like a pastor by the word of God now, we, we know it's not just his job to do all that for you. He's to lead you and show you the truth, show you the word of God, and we're to implement it and be reading the word of God on our own. And that solidifies what is being taught, what's being preached. Anyway, amen. If you want to write this verse down as well, 
Jeremiah 3.15, Jeremiah 3.15, God gives pastors after his own heart to feed with knowledge and understanding from the word of God. Jeremiah 3.15, God gives pastors after his own heart to feed with knowledge and understanding from the word of God. That lets us know if God gives it, we're to have it. God gave it in the Old Testament. Jesus gives it in the New Testament. So we have no right to say, oh, no, I don't need a pastor. No, I don't need that. I don't need that. We're called to in both multiple scriptures, but at least one example in each testament, at the very least. I mean, we've covered more than that, but you can catch the heart of Old Testament and New Testament says they're given for God's people. Amen. So number 14, our last one, Have their names written in heaven. Christians are to have their names written in heaven. So we're going to go back to Luke because I like to quote Jesus first before we go any further in any of these things because if we're to be as Christ, if he's supposed to be our example, we're supposed to be like him. So if he says it, then we're to go by it. We know if it's in the word, we're to go by it. But I like to see this, especially if Jesus is the commanding officer of God's army we know that God's the commander in chief but if Jesus is the commanding officer then what he says what he commands we're to do and what he commands that we're to have we should have so he says that we're to have our names written in heaven so Luke chapter 10 verse 17 Luke chapter 10 verse 17 And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So they get all excited. They get all excited. The devils, they flee when we call your name. They flee because we have this power. Verse 18. And he, Jesus, said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Verse 20. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not. He says, though you've got the power to overcome any enemy, they can't really hurt you. He says, rejoice in this. Don't rejoice in this. He says, rejoice in that the spirits are subject unto you. Don't rejoice in that. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. He said, that's what you rejoice at. Not that you got power to flex your spiritual muscles and say, I can do this and I can do that. Watch this demon run because I'm doing this. Watch this because I'm, I got the power of God on me. No, no, no. He says, you rejoice because your name's written in heaven. Because really, if your name's not written in heaven, you don't have that power and authority. You don't have those things working in your life. Unless you're a Balaam's donkey. And nobody wants to be a Balaam's donkey. Where God uses you once or twice. Well, in Balaam's donkey's case, he only got used once. And then we never hear from him again. For some people, they like to play Balaam's donkey to be used once or twice, but never really have a relationship with God. That shouldn't be, that shouldn't be us. We shouldn't seek, shouldn't seek to be used and not know God. Because God will only do that a couple of times out of, I would dare say, sheer necessity. We should want to know God and be used by God regularly because we know Him and He knows us. But we should rejoice because our names are written in heaven. So let's go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Read a couple of verses here. Philippians 4, we're going to start at verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, true companion, help those women which labored with me in the gospel also, Clement, also, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So Paul is taking a moment to say, I want you to take care of these people that labor with me. Not so much, not just because they're fellow laborers, not just because they work with me, but because their names are written in the book of life. So in other words, he's saying, that's your brother and sister. These are 
fellow believers. They have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. They have their name written just as you do. So make sure you take care of them. Make sure you treat them well. In verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So he, so he goes to say, take care of these that labor with us. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Have be full of cheer. Be excited. Let your moderation, let your appropriateness, your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. So if we know the Lord is at hand, we need to make sure our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. We need to make sure our name is written down because without that, we don't enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we've got to make sure that we have our names written in heaven. But with this, What's he say in verse 5? Let your moderation, let your appropriateness be known unto all men. Because if your name's written in heaven, that means you should have an appropriateness about your life that you're a living epistle before everybody else. Amen. But he begins it with, these aren't just fellow laborers. These aren't just people that are working with me. They're also believers because of where their name is written. Amen. So let's go to Revelation, last couple of verses here. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus speaking, even though he's speaking to John the Revelator, who is blind and speaking this out to have it written down on the Isle of Patmos. It says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. So that means if he says he won't, then that means he can. So let's read it again. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, or we would say white garments. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So we're to have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. And we're to not betray Jesus, betray God the Father, betray the kingdom of heaven, that our names are not blotted out. So now I will say that just one simple mistake will not blot out your names in the Lamb's book of life. We get that. God has mercy, God has grace. But when we begin to live a habitual lifestyle of sin, that means we're backsliding and we're turning away from God. And when we turn away from God, we turn away from Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord and our Master, then that means that we're no longer wanting our book in that name, so God comes along and wipes it out. So he says here, He that overcometh, he that endures to the end and overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. That means we're going to receive that white garment, that white blessing of being in heaven, those white robes. And I will not blot out his name of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father. That means he's going to say our name before God. So we know in the Gospels, he says he's going to say our name because if we deny him, he'll deny us. If we confess him before men, he'll confess us before God the Father. So it's important that we find our name there, and it's important that we continue to confess Jesus as our Savior and our Lord and Master. Last verse, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, verse 27. Revelation 21, 27. And there shall in no wise enter into... It anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So let me read that from the NASB version. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. That means heaven. So no, nothing unclean, so that means we need to be clean before God. No one who practices abomination. Remember, practices. Now we, we understand that, yes, 
We may sin. That's the reason we need to be quick to repent and say, Father, forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Help me. Cleanse me. Make me right with you. Help me to be in right standing. Help me to stay in your grace and in your mercy. That we, can, that we just are quick to wash that off and say, Father, I did it. Forgive me. And we're quick to move on. To say, Father, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for helping me. And we continue to move on. That's not a practice. That's a, I messed up, shouldn't have, but I did. Practice means when you do it over and over and over. Why? Because you want it. You want it. Because you're wanting to repeat that cycle over and over and over again. That's the difference between knowing that you're born again and knowing that you're backslidden or away from God is that you continue to practice in your life, sinful nature. Whereas when we're born again, doesn't mean we'll stop sinning 100%, but you'll notice that you don't practice sin like you used to. You're made a new creature in Christ. But coming back to this, nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the only people that will enter into the kingdom of heaven is those who have their names written in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. So may we have our names written. May we read the word of God. May we have a shepherd, a a pastor, and may we have our names written in heaven. Amen. Amen. Well, before I forget it, if you would like one, I do have printouts front and back of our whole series that we have. It's got... All of our verses over here, uh, so we've got that up here in front. I didn't want to hand it out because I didn't want you sneaking peeks before we, in case we didn't finish it. So we do have it up here. If you'd like one of those, you can take one with you. Uh, I think there's roughly 15 or 16 copies, so you can take a couple of them if you would like to. But I encourage you to go back and, and look over these because these are the Christian basic training that we have as Christians. And we can see Jesus specifically said each and every one of these things. This is really only, this ain't, I don't even think this is scratching the surface of everything that Jesus covered, but this is a good 14 things for us to look at and to say, I need to make sure these are in my life. Amen. So may we cover these 14, may we mature in these things, and maybe we'll study other things that Jesus says that we can add to our life if we're not already. Amen. Amen.